And now I'm just going to introduce the first panel. Um, so the first panel is called Demystifying IP. How important is IP to tech startups? And it will be chaired and moderated by Dr. Chris Donegan, who is the co-founder of Invention Capital Associates, um, an advisory and investment firm focused on um, intangible assets. And I think over the last 17 years, he's co-founded a number of IP-rich companies, most notably in the life sciences, financial services, and disruptive materials. So I'll invite him to take his place and to introduce the other members of the panel. So um, I have the great privilege of presenting to you this morning this esteemed panel of IP experts to talk about that old chestnut, um, does IP matter in startups? Yeah. So we're going to try and give it a little bit of... Uh, of a different twist this morning, um, hopefully. Ignore everything you can see on the agenda, I've thrown it out. Um, I think we should start really with introducing everybody and who they are. Uh, I, apparently, did I have an introduction, Tima? You did. Was it very Im you exciting and fantastic? <laughs> so, don't need to know about me then. Um, so let's start at this end of the, uh, the grey hair of the, of the chair. Um, <laughs> well, thank you very much. Please go, go for it. Awesome. Uh, my name is John Ilsley. I'm a director uh, at Moore Stevens, a financial advisory accounting service. Uh, I've been there for a couple of years. I specialise in IP valuation. Uh, prior to, to joining Moore Stevens, I was an owner director of an IP valuation consultancy. And um, I sort of poached to turn game people. I've actually been on the other side. So my prior experience to that is I've done actually a couple of startups from scratch, admittedly not in technology, but one for Virgin and one for Unilever. So I have some practical experience of the difficulty some of you guys face and, um, and some other sort of professional approaches that we would adopt to help you. Hi, I'm Gareth Jones. I look after intellectual property for a, a company called Benevolent AI and we're using technology to enhance and accelerate scientific discovery, particularly looking at uh, making, developing new medicines faster and, and ideally cheaper. Um, my background, so I've also worked for another startup called SwiftKey, and I looked after the intellectual property there, and we sold that to Microsoft um, about two years ago. Um, and I've worked for, for other more larger tech businesses, Microsoft um, after the SwiftKey acquisition, uh, and previously for Vodafone and for IBM. Uh, good morning, I'm another Jones. My name's Keith Jones. Uh, I'm a patent attorney. Uh, I've been in IP for about 30 years since I came out of university with a degree in, in physics. Uh, I work for a firm called Megatroid, which is a, a pan-European firm of, of patent and trademark attorneys. Uh, the majority of the work that I do is really these days for Silicon Valley companies uh, with fairly large uh, European patent portfolios. But I also do uh, a reasonable amount of work for UK uh, startups and SMEs. So is it a nice blend of uh, operating experience and advisory. Um, and just to sort of uh, return the favour, could I start with a show of hands? Is there anyone here that's actually an entrepreneur and runs a company? Fantastic. Excellent. Well, hopefully this will be useful here. So first with the bad news, um, most startups end in failure. <coughs> According to CB Insights, 70% of tech companies fail uh, even after they've got their first round of VC funding. So you think that's the hurdle, it's really just the beginning of the misery. Um, <laughs> according to CB Insights, the reasons that these companies fail are 42% there is no market need for the product or service they're offering, 29% they run out of money, 23% the team implodes, they can't get along with each other, and 19% they get out-competed by a fast mover who takes their idea and beats them to it. And brought, you could probably attach IP somewhat to that last category, but IP doesn't feature very heavily in the causes of corporate failure in tech startups. So I'll throw this to the panel. Hearing that, how important is IP to tech startups? We'll start with the okay. ex experience. Okay. I, th I think the, the examples you've given are very, are very interesting because they address the practical issues that you have of starting a business from scratch. Um, and, and quite frankly, if you don't have a good commercial idea to, as your core of your premise and you don't get that to market, then you're going to have a problem. And at each stage of the evolution of your business, you need to make sure that you're hitting the various uh, finance points or step points uh, to make sure that you can continue to secure 
the investment that you need to keep going forward. However, at the end of the day, the core thing that is the premise of your business is the idea that you own and that you've developed. And therefore, making sure that you understand how and when to control it is, is extremely important. That doesn't mean, from my perspective, that you patent everything, but that you have an understanding of what is your, your key point of difference. Not least for the fact your investors will look to make sure that when they put money into you, they're going to get a return from that and the security around that will be important. So I think from my perspective, kind of whether IP is important or not, for, it doesn't really matter necessarily whether you're a, a startup or a, or a larger business. I think the way in which you, you manage that IP and decide the, the decisions you make will, will vary dramatically. You know, a, a larger business will be more complicated and have you know, more resources, and, and so there'll be a great many differences. But in terms of whether it's important or not, I think it, the bigger factor is more what industry you operate in, what type of business are you, what's your you know, value add to the market, and so on. And, and then your IP decisions as to whether IP is important, I think that's where it, where it really plays in. So if you're, a, if you're a fundamental tech business, you know, really innovating on some core technology, then perhaps patents are particularly important in comparison to, to maybe a business that's more where you're, the innovation is more around um, a business process or, or business model innovation. Um, and then, and whether you're operating in a B2C market or a B2B market, maybe your brand kind of and trademark issues are, are different and so on. I think, that, I think it's those kind of differences that have a bigger impact as to versus the, the size of the business. Yeah, I think uh, an interesting t statistic from that, I thought, was the fact that if you haven't got a product or a, a service that people want to buy, then that, that's a fundamental reason for your business failing. Um, I mean, I think fundamentally that's what you've got to have. And if you've got that, then where I see the IP coming in is that uh, you need to look at what it is that you've got that's, that's, that's of value or what it is that you've got that you can create value out of. Uh, and you've then got to address um, whether or not you can use IP as a tool, which is what it is, as a tool to, to somehow uh, uh, maximise or, or protect that value. Um, and th there's, there's various different ways of doing that, but I think the important thing in terms of startups is that you've got to go through the process of at least considering IP uh, and what role it's going to play in your business and how you're going to use it as part of the same decision-making process you make at the front end of the business in terms of how you're going to structure the business, what you're going to sell, how you're going to sell it. It's all part of that, all part of that uh, initial consideration. So I think that, that, that's, that's where the importance is, is look at the value and work out how IP can be used to to, to protect that. Okay, so um, let's look at the flip side of that coin. Um, a lot of academic research, and I've read a lot of it, um, curse of being a former academic, um, tells you that IP is important. There are numerous studies coming out of Stanford and the World Intellectual Property Organization and so on that all say IP is really important. It's really important. It's really, really important. Um, there's not really much anecdotal or systematic or hard data that I've seen that's really convincing. There's a lot of correlation, but there isn't much evidence of causation. But having said that, um, according to the latest study from uh, the US uh, Intellectual Property Organization, if you have patents before you get your money, you're twice as likely to succeed. Uh, if you have patents or other valuable IP, you're 80% more likely to have an IPO than if you don't. That's what these numbers say. I don't know what they, if it's true or not, but that's what they say. So um, IP is not enough. You have to have a good idea that people want. But apparently, if you have some and you protect it well, the end result can be a lot better. Now, I've got a couple of anecdotal um, examples that I could use, but I wonder whether we start at this end of the panel, I mean, or in fact, we, why don't we start with our practitioner? <laughs> I, I'm guessing that your IP was pretty valuable when Microsoft came calling. I like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so I mean, we, we spent a lot of time kind of thinking about the IP strategy at SwiftKey and, and, you know, trying to work out what made sense for a business and when we were thinking about, you know, exit strategy for the business, if that looked like an acquisition, what might be appealing to potential acquirers, and so that, that absolutely factored into to those assets that, that we created, and we had a, a patent portfolio, a trademark portfolio, and, and a bunch of other kind of IP rights associated with the business, and, and yeah, absolutely they would have factored into that, that whole transaction. 
Was there any actual value assigned to them, or was it, was it a significant part of the negotiation? Or if you can't say because you signed an <laughs> NDA, then that's, that's fair enough? Yeah, so I can't talk about the specifics, but, but certainly um, they were... It wasn't so. IP absolutely wasn't the driver for the acquisition. You know, there's there's a, a number of, of drivers into to what why that the Swiftkey business was useful to Microsoft, but it certainly played a big part in in the whole kind of negotiation discussion and so on, and and, and obviously the the due diligence and so on. IP kind of was a big big factor in that. Keith, what's your thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, I mean, just going back to the importance, I think w one of the, the organisations you're talking about stressing the importance, I'm not necessarily sure that they're saying that you've got to have IP. I think what they're probably saying is you need to think about IP, and I think that's where a lot of people are falling down because they're not thinking about it in the first place. So I think you at least need to go through the, 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 the process of it. Um, in terms of personal experience, I mean, I'm working with a company at the minute who's building a huge patent portfolio um, purely because uh, it wants to make sure that it's going to maximise its exit value when it sells up in two or three years' time. Um, so I think you know, that's the way that IP does play a role in the same way it did with SwiftKey. Uh, well, from, from, from my perspective, and I suppose it's partly coming from working in and around the corporate finance team uh, in, in an accounting business, um, that you know, when, you, when you look at value from an investor's point of view, a, a core component part of the investment process is what risk is involved. And if they're doing typical, very boring accounting models to do that, you actually try and quantify that risk and it has an impact on value. Um, and, and therefore, in, from my perspective, there is no doubt that when you get to that process, an you know, investor is looking at you, I don't think he's really looking at, it, this is a generalisation, he's not always looking to, to get hold of your patent, but he wants to get hold of your business. And if your business is in an early stage, you don't yet have that... Uh, you know, credibility of being a major brand or significant sales, what is he buying? You know, he's buying of the future potential of your business. And the risk for him, once he's actually assessed that the business looks to him as if he has value, the, the risk to him is significantly reduced if he believes that the company can protect its asset going forward. Now, it might sound a bit negative, but that's why I actually think for the right businesses, it's incredibly important. And I, and I certainly agree with what you said, because there'll be some other businesses where, quite frankly, I'm not sure I would believe that patenting is actually the right thing to do and I would also warn, it's like war story here, sorry, uh, you know, I would warn against inventor uh, arrogance or egotism in the belief that you, know, you patent everything and therefore you generate value from those patents and I'm working with a client at the moment who's done that and quite frankly 95% of them are completely worthless and he's spending far too much money <laughs> of limited money on renewals. So it's really a question of horses for courses and understanding your business. And I. I couldn't reiterate more what's already been said by the panel. You know, when you're in an early stage of a business, you know, things change incredibly quickly. And you, you, you might have a great idea, but you can't predict how the, how the customer is going to move, how the market's going to move. The most important thing you have to do is have a pretty clear vision of where you're going, but you've got to be pretty flexible along the way. And understanding where your IP fits into that strategy is really, really important. And don't, you know, have a good, have a good idea, but don't set out, must do this, must do this. Constantly reappraise your business, as you will have to as a startup business to be successful. Yeah, I think I think from an investor perspective, I guess it's more about being able to tell the right kind of story. You know, it's exactly right. You're selling yourself and your idea. Exactly. An investor, as you say, will want reduced risk and they'll want increased value. And it's kind of what do you do to be able to tell that story the yeah. right way? And if yeah. that's to, to protect nothing with IP rights, then maybe that's fine. But as yeah. long as you can back up either way. We, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's very interesting because when you look at these studies. I'm going to read you a quote. <clears throat> Winning a first patent boosts a startup's subsequent growth and innovation by facilitating access to funding from VCs, banks, and other investors. Um, there's a panel on this this afternoon, which um, I'm involved in, and I've spent quite a bit of time over my career dealing, talking to investors and VCs, and my, a common realisation is that there's a box that you need to tick if you want money from those people. And one of the boxes says, do they have IP? And if you don't tick the box, your probability of getting money decreases. But outside of signaling that you might have some IP, irrespective of its potential worth, and the IPR rate on tech patents, as we know, is extremely high. So many patents are found invalid even after they're granted. Um, are there any other 
benefits to having IP that aren't hard benefits. So if I talk to an IP or a patent attorney, they'll often tell you freedom to operate, you need to protect yourself, you need to be able to stop others infringing your patent, your, your business. But actually, does it help with recruitment? Does it help with positioning? Does it help with all the soft stuff that might be more important early on in the business? Or is it a bit of a distraction? If you don't want VC money, does it matter? It has tax implications in the UK as well. So there's a thing called the patent box. So you can uh, uh, patented products attract reduced um, uh, tax on profits. So there's a, there's a fiscal reason for having them as well. Um, I think... <laughs> I think it depends on the industry you're in. I mean, sources for courses. I think you know some some if you're competing. In a, uh, a companies they use as industry you're in the type of thing you're doing. I think um, I, I don't think there's anything particularly measurable in terms of you know employee returns or anything like that. I mean, I'm sure employees chuff to bits when they get a patent granted and that has a, has a positive benefit and the, and the company likes to see them but you've got to weigh that against the cost I think. Yeah I think sometimes some of the IP work you can do can help to drive other things. So talking about recruitment was interesting because that, that made me think well one of the things is are very collaborative Discussion and so on, and, and kind of, but to be able to to publish details about your technology, perhaps you want to protect it in some way first, whether with patents or or, or some other mechanism. And so, I think the more perhaps you use IP rights to give you confidence that you've protected your assets, the more you can then do other things. Um, so whether that's publish information about your technology, whether it's to help you give confidence when you're collaborating with external partners in terms of, you know, if you're say if you're licensing out your technology, if you can actually define what that technology is because you have patent assets associated with it, then that can help ease that conversation. Um, and so there's a bunch of kind of side benefits, I think, to, to IP kind of protection. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I mean, I think um, you know, potentially, I guess, in certain fields, it can help you recruit if you um, if you have a reputation and image as, as an inventive company. Um, it can definitely be used, and and certainly does appear to be used by some companies as a marketing tool. I mean, we have this amount of patents this year and applied for, and that and you look at some of those statistics and think, oh, I can't all be worth that. So it's you know that much, but that's part of that process. Um, but I think also it can. Um, you know, build into your brand image of being an inventive company if it's used a certain way. Yes. And, um, and I think understanding the importance of building a brand in any business at any point in time is really important. It doesn't mean you have to, how much money you put into it, start, but a pretty good idea of where you're going with it is important. So I guess it can. Um, I would say still, having, having done two startups, not in tech, the biggest problem that we face is quite frankly, you need to sell. You, know, you need to get your product into market and sell. Um, and, and, the, and the quickest way to build value into your business, which incorporates IP and intangibles and goodwill and everything else, is to actually get a customer out there buying it. And if you lose sight of that, then yeah. you've got a bit of a problem. So that's a bit of a, you know, it, this can be a distraction, but it's important to understand that it can be used that way. Now, this is called Future Tech, and, and I, I have a strong biotech background, not so much um, uh, probably electronic engineering, but more biotechnology engineering, and certainly in in life sciences, patents are pretty important for your business model. If you, you know, licensing is probably the most viable business model for a for young biotech. And then M and A. Um, not many people go from a startup to, you know, become Genentech. Um, so for for me, on the patent side, there's a very heavy. The biggest and most relevant business issue for me is how does it feed into your business model and your pricing structure. Um, and I think that you know, that's something I'd be interested in, in the panel's views on because in theory, of course, a patent-protected unique asset has pricing power. And if you want to make some money uh, and you want to get third-party distributors involved, you've got something to work with. If it's a trade secret or some soft know-how or something like that, it's a lot harder. Have you had experience in that, John? Um, and when so you're valuing companies, do you, how does that play into the valuation? Uh, in terms of in terms of valuing, I could just have a separate day on that. <laughs> separate, but um, there's no doubt that if you're valuing, um, you know, a business and you're looking to value the IP, 
And quite frankly, it has to have IP to be able to do that. Otherwise, you, you, from an accounting perspective, you actually don't have the correct boxes ticked to actually be able to recognise it from a, a standards point of view. Um, but typically, the way you would then value patents or any type of IP, and it's just one technique, is you look at a thing called the relief from royalty method. It's an it's a lot of accounting jargon, but it basically works on the principle that if you own some IP, it means you don't have to license it. So effectively, you're relieved from paying a license fee. So if you can work out what a license fee for your technology would be, you can then apply that across your future sales and discount it back to a present value. It's really boring, guys. If you, if no, really no, but I'm, I'm interested. The reason, I ask, the reason I ask is there, there are a couple of investment banks in the US that, that specialise in a, in a very interesting um, approach to company exits, which is they'll take a company that has a reasonable technology and then they will backfill a whole bunch of patents into the company and then they'll go do a fundraiser or an IPO and the diligence on the quality of those assets is so poor that there's almost always a premium involved in the exercise yeah. and everyone's a winner except possibly the investor. Yeah. Um, and so I wonder if you have a box ticked, does anyone look beyond the tick? Um, I think it's. I mean, I think it's. I think it's incredibly difficult to do good due diligence on patent portfolios. Quite frankly, um, it's quite simply because there can be so many items within it, and you know that the fact that a patent exists doesn't mean that it's valuable. You know, that's that's a, a sort of core premise from a valuation perspective, but also from just a business perspective. It, it, it basically protects an idea, and if that idea isn't valuable in itself, right. neither is the patent. Right. Um, and um, I'd also reiterate as well that you know the thing that you've already mentioned that an awful lot of patents fall over when they actually get challenged. So again, just because you own a patent doesn't necessarily mean that it's valuable. From a due diligence point of view, it's really difficult. It's really really difficult, and you need to get tech specialists. If I was an investor, I would certainly look to get technical people in to come and look at what the key um, patents, the key technology that you are actually investing in, and make sure that, that was secure. We've talked a little bit about patents, but you know, art, patents aren't the only fruit. Right? I mean, there's other IP. Um, I had the great uh, pleasure to spend some time with the founders of Monzo recently, um, which is one of the UK's fastest growing fintechs. I think they've raised in the region of about 80 million pounds in capital. Um, but Monzo wasn't always called Monzo. It was called something else. Uh, it turned out that somebody else owned the name, and they'd already gone through one round of VC funding before they discovered that, um, which surprised me. It was quite an interesting you know, thing. It, it, other than the patents in SwiftKey, SwiftKey is a pretty cool trademark. I assume mm. it's a trademark. It is, yeah. Right. Uh, how, do you think that built in terms of building brand and positioning your company in the, in, in the minds of people, do you think that was a key, a key part? I think it was, yeah, I think absolutely. I think SwiftKey, being a, a consumer brand, so it was a, for those that don't know, SwiftKey was a, um, a smartphone keyboard, so a software keyboard that predicted your next words, corrected your typos, and so on. And um, originally, so it was a, a direct-to-consumer product. You could download the app from the App Store and and use that as, as your keyboard. And so the the brand was hugely valuable in growing that that user base. So people had to understand the brand to replace the keyboard on your smartphone. Is you know for a smartphone user, is probably a, a pretty unusual thing to do. So you have to have some level of confidence in in the brand behind it that that it's not going to you know mess up your phone or anything. And so I think developing that brand from a marketing perspective was absolutely essential. Um, we also at SwiftKey did a lot of B two B licensing. So we had uh, the likes of, of Samsung who would take our technology and, and use that on their phones. And so then you need confidence in the brand from that that perspective. And so and then underpinning that is then the trademark piece that, that feeds into that. But absolutely, the, the brand was essential for that, that business. So Keith, it sounds like a joined up IP strategy, even for a relatively small company, is pretty important. Yeah, and I mean, I think there's, there's a good example, and, and, and John sort of alluded to this as well earlier, that fundamentally, you know, what was important about SwiftKey was it was a good product uh, uh, and it built up a great reputation as a result of that. So at the heart of it, that's the important thing. It's that it's a quality product that people want to buy. Where the IP comes in is in terms of trying to support that, trying to support the, the commercial aim, the reputation that's been built up uh, to prevent others from, from using a similar trademark or a similar brand. Um, so I mean, they're, they're, you know, there's a good example where fundamentally you've got to have something that people want to buy in the first place and then the IP can help you support that underneath. And that, that brand protection is really 
difficult to do for an early stage business, right? Because most most businesses these days are global from day one, and so to try and do that freedom to operate search to understand that your brand hasn't yeah. been used elsewhere on a global basis, and then to protect it yourself on a global basis when you're starting with minimal resources, I think it's an incredibly difficult thing to do, and you, to work out where the balance is, when to invest in in those searches or, or or trademark applications and so on is is quite hard, and I think that again depends on how valuable the brand is to the business, but. Um, yeah, that's, that's difficult to manage. So a lot of the um, discussions that you have on panels like this are all about um, thinking about identifying your own IP and how do you quantify it, clarify it and market it. But there's another option available to smaller businesses which can be relatively inexpensive and very powerful, which is to license in or buy IP from third parties. Universities are chocked full of IP and technology transfer offices also. My apologies to the tech transfer offices, but I have a very dim view of their ability to commercialize their IP, um, no matter how many LinkedIn posts they, they make. Um, and there are a large number of companies now also who have plenty of IP they're trying to figure out what to do with and would quite like to give themselves some brownie points by cooperating with SMEs. Um, in terms of... Um, IP strategy, um, Keith. Have you have you seen any of that happening yet, or, or is that the exception rather than the rule? Uh, no, I don't think it's the exception. It's perfectly valid. Um, you know, part of the strategy again, it comes to working out what best fits with your with your business model and how to support your your commercial aims. Uh, so I think you know, quite often uh, there's IP out there that people um, want to take a license for, and uh, the proprietors of the of the IP are quite often willing to to, to license because uh, it's a you know valuable source of income from them as well. So uh, yeah, I think you see you see both both situations quite commonly. And um, John, do you how do you, how do you react when you see licensed IP versus homegrown? Does it make any difference? No, I, I, to be honest, I, um, to me, I don't think it makes. I don't. I don't look at them differently. I mean, I think that the thing that I would say is that you, you depending on what industry you're in, you may be a, you know, a hugely creative and inventive company, but actually then building the, the rest of the business infrastructure to monetize that um, can be beyond your resources or your abilities, or quite frankly, you might not get the funding or, you know, you need to get there quickly, then, you know, adopting a licensing approach is exactly right. So I, I actually think it's really just a question, again, of what's your business strategy and what's the you know, what's your market like that you're working with? What's the competitor position like? Um, you know, and I think there's a great risk, and it's, again, it, it's, I'm trying to push people towards one approach or not, but if you've got something which is really cutting edge, but incredibly expensive um, and time consuming to get to market, if you can partner with somebody effective through your licensing program that gets that product to market faster, that to me would be a less risky approach and a, and a, and a better commercialization. So, um, you know, it depends again, market and what your product is and what technology you've got. Yeah, it depends on what, why. Why would you need to win license those assets in the first place? You know, it's interesting for me. So on the benevolent side, we've you know on the so the business is split in two. We have a tech business and a and the bio business. And on the bio side, we've in license you know bio assets because you need you know those are the unique assets you need to be able to leverage your your product. And so you have to in license those on the tech side. To in license tech assets, you have to have a really specific need, I think, for them. Whether that's risk reduction, or, or you know, there's a particular type of technology that's very unique that you you want to take advantage of, um, or or you have a particular market player that perhaps introduces risk because they're particularly litigious in the patent space or something like that. But I think you have to yeah really think what's the value of in licensing those those specific assets to your business and, and why are you doing it. So uh, we're we're approaching. Um 21 shopping days to Christmas or something, so I'm told. Um, and there used to be a, uh, an advert on television that said a puppy is not just for Christmas. Uh, obviously people get bored of their puppies when they get a bit older and require more, more walking and more cleaning. Um, well, IP, it turns out, is not just for Christmas either. And once you've got it, you have a burden because you look after it and keep working on it and improve it and defend it, perhaps. Um, Keith, is IP just you know more trouble than it's worth? Why don't you just publish and be damned? <laughs> it could well be your strategy. It could well be a perfectly uh, 
valid strategy. Uh, again, it comes back to this horses for courses. It depends entirely on, on what your situation is. You've got to, you've got to balance up the, the risks and the costs, particularly with IP, uh, against the value, just like you, you would any other business decision that you make in terms of a spend within your business. Um, uh, and it can be very dependent on you know, where you are, where you want to get to, what your business looks like, what the competition looks like, you know, how you want to achieve these, these aims. Um, I think it would be a, a, a big generalisation to say, you know, it's not worth it, publish and be damned. But I think the important thing is you need to, you know, going back to what I said previously, you need to consider it and decide, you know, what's involved, what it's going to cost, and continually review it, as we've said. Uh, continue to look at what your IP strategy and your IP policy is, and, you know, whether it still remains valid, depending on what you're doing as your business develops. Keith, what percentage of your budget did you spend on IP, would you say? 5%, 1%, 50%? <laughs> uh, I wouldn't like to say. <laughs> um, it's difficult, and it depends on, on the two businesses as well. So looking at level, you know, on the bio business, we might spend a very different percentage than we would for the, for the tech business, and, and that would be allocated in very different ways within IP. I think, I think again, it comes down to, yeah, what, what does that IP action, that IP kind of process and, and asset give you to a business? And, and the amount that you would invest in that is, is very dependent on what, what you expect the, the output from that to be. Joel? Um, is, it, is, it too, is it a pain in the neck? Should we? Oh, are you no, creating I, a problem for yourself to you know, look after it, maintain it, defend it? No, ab absolutely not. I mean, I couldn't, I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with what you said about yeah. You know, just you've got to continue to monitor it. Mm. But but you're always looking to to lock in value into your business at some point. You know, whether you're a startup or further down the line. And, and quite frankly, when you when you start to look at your business when it's a bit bigger, you know you, the value of your business is going to be way over the value of its net assets. You're going to have this big thing called goodwill, and that wraps up intangible assets and IP. But actually, that you know effectively, when somebody buys you, they're buying a future income stream. That's that's how the value is derived, and anything that gives you greater security over that income stream, whether it's patents or whether it's trademarks or design rights, is important. The most important thing is don't protect something that's not worth protecting. <laughs> don't waste your money on that. Um, and the other thing which, which is a, a much bigger subject, which we haven't got time for, is always look to build your brand. Always look to build your brand. Your patents are defined by a period of time. They're not going to last forever, but your brand, properly managed, forever. lasts forever. Mm -hmm. So all the way along the line, you must always look at what you're trying to create in terms of your brand around your reputation, what it says about you, what about the products that you're doing. Um, it's not devoid from the reality of what you do. I mean, I, I, mean, you know, I, I set up a new business for Richard Branson many, many years ago, and that was the era when, when Virgin, uh, well, Richard would describe himself as a branded venture capitalist and put the Virgin brand on all sorts of things. If you actually look at the place now, not many of those businesses are still around. <laughs> and that's because actually you can't separate the brand from all the other things. But if your brand is complementary, it flies. You know? So that would be my advice. It's always valuable. Just make sure you know which bits are valuable. I think from a, from a startup perspective, one of the difficult things is that I mean, by definition, a startup is still searching for a repeatable, scalable business model. And so they're going to change what they're doing quite a lot, whether that's changing right. the technology, changing the, the business model, changing the, you know, the, the way in which the business operates, who the customers are, and I think trying to then you know, align your IP strategy with something that isn't necessarily well defined or might change very quickly is, yes. is quite hard, and so I think flexibility tends to be the, the key thing. Um, so you need to operate with minimal resources to try and kind of predict what the future is, and then and just, it's, yeah, it's a difficult, difficult thing to balance, but I think and I think that's particularly hard for startups versus kind of more mature businesses. It's a very good point. Um, just so I'm on track with timing, is there a man with a crook? We've got 15 minutes left. Oh, excellent. Okay, so um, let's get. I'd like to get into that a little bit more, actually. Um, when's the right time? And I know we said, oh, it's important company set up and so on, but, but given what Keith just said, you know, I've been involved with any number of startups, and quite often you change your business at least three times in the first two years when you have contact with the market. So um, surely you shouldn't be worrying about your IP during that period because you're just going to waste money on things that are no longer relevant to your core proposition. Isn't that, you know, do, you, do, you, do you say to people when they come to you, don't come to me, I'm a patent attorney, go home, come back later? Sometimes, yes. Yeah. Um, 
You're the only Patterson I've ever heard say that. <laughs> <laughs> I think sometimes you can see that there is no value in somebody spending money on, say, a patent. Of course, we, you know, we're talking very much about patents, not forgetting all the other IP issues and you know, uh, uh, things there are to do with IP. Um, quite often businesses at too early stage, I mean, they, you know, they may not have even developed a prototype, say, uh, they've not even actually reduced the thing to practice. Um, and, of course, there's a huge difference, as we said at the beginning, between coming up with a great idea and turning that great idea into a commercial, marketable business or product that people actually want to buy. There's a, there's a, there's a massive difference between them. But, for example, in the US, there's a first-to-file process. If you don't file, you've got nothing. So waiting seems dangerous. And we're talking about global businesses. Right? So the, 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 probably the US is a big market for them. There's always a balance to be struck between, uh, if you're looking particularly at patents, there's always a balance to be struck on, on the time in between you know, uh, when, have we, when do we know enough about what our invention is, say, and what we're going to do with it uh, as compared to if we wait too long, somebody else is going to beat us to it. There's always that, that, that difficult judgment to make. I mean, th there are ways around that in that you can file early patent applications that you don't actually take any further forward. There's still a cost implication because you've got to get those applications prepared and filed. But you don't necessarily have to carry on with them. You can ditch them and start again. Um, and, you know, th and there can be various strategies like that for approaching it. But it's, it, there's, no, there's no magic answer, I'm afraid, to this is the point in which you should go for it. Because, it, again, it can depend on all sorts of things. Um, but you know, the, the, the sooner you take advice uh, and you know build up your knowledge based on what it is that you want to achieve, then the sooner, the, the more informed decisions you can make. I think that's the, is, the, is the real answer. You know, so, oh. I'm curious between your new company mm. and your old one, have you learned anything around this sort of area that you're applying? Is there some change in the way you think about it as a result? Um. So I mean, the, the two businesses are very different, so it's kind of hard to take lessons from one from, uh, from the other, but there's, there's certainly some. I guess um, one of the things I always think about with startups, if, especially if you're, if you're a tech startup and you're developing really fundamental, innovative technology, then actually the ideas you have at the earlier stage are potentially your most valuable if, if that technology does go on to, to stay. And so at the time that you have least resources, you potentially have the ideas that you want to invest most in, in protecting. And that's again comes down to that trying to predict the future kind of kind of balance. And I think that's quite difficult to to do. And then so the the longer you can wait and the more flexibility you have, I think that can be really valuable. But of course the longer you wait, not only do you risk kind of competitors coming along and, and doing these things, but you risk disclosing these ideas yourself, whether that's kind of through your, your own products or through your kind of you know public kind of engagements and, and so on, or just just you know accidental uh, um, disclosure and so on. So balancing that is difficult, and I think it, again it comes down to case by case business. It depends on the business, it depends on the technology, it depends on the on the strategy, and and you really it's very difficult to generalise. So John, I I work with a. Uh, software company a couple of years ago and um, they uh, viewed themselves as a um, copyright machine and by that I mean that they took investors money in at the one end and they produced code and, and, and they had a product at the other end but the product wasn't yet launched and it was quite a long development process and, and so at every board meeting and investor meeting they would show how, many, how much code they produced and they'd almost capitalize it. You gave me a million dollars, I have a million dollars of copyright, you see? It's, that's how it works. Sadly, the business went bankrupt um, <laughs> after $45 million of investors' money. But, um, but lots of code. But lots of code, <laughs> right? So, um, again, we talked about patents, we've talked a little bit about, about trademarks. You know, uh, copyright is, in software at least, is, it exists, right? It's some important. And I've been told many times by, uh, by computer people, of which I'm not, otherwise I wouldn't use the word computer people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> trade secret, NDA, restrictive covenants, employment agreements, copyright, time, date, stamp. There's a whole non-patent way of securing and protecting really your material. 
do you think that adds any value, or are people just getting paranoid and it's pointless? Just go to market, get your product out there, and move on. No, I think I actually think it's I think it's extremely important, and I think if you're if you're going for a non-patented approach, um, you need to be within your business making sure that your IP, which you've chosen not to legally <coughs> protect from an enforcement point, is protected as much as you can through all other forms of uh, corporate governance or legal process so I actually think that's definitely the approach you should go if you're not going to patent and you've got this great idea the last thing you want is your guy down, working down in R&D just going off himself and starting again so um, I actually think it's incredibly important and, I, and I was, I'm repeating myself if you're not going to patent you need to have a pretty good idea of how you're looking to protect your trade secrets the confidentiality of your business it's incredibly important. I think there's a, there's a balance to be had there. So there's there's securing your your kind of your external walls, uh, if you like, so that you don't kind of share that information with um, people outside the business. But by doing that, the easiest way to do it is to really lock down internally. But actually, I think there's there's a, a balance to be had where the more information you can share internally, and I'm a big proponent of this, then the 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 more innovative and faster pace a business can be. So you kind of you increase your your disclosure risk, but actually you increase the pace of the business and information sharing and those kind of those conversations that might have otherwise not have happened. And I think the more you can can do that, you help with that that first mover advantage. Yeah, I mean that's definitely true too. You're not going to learn as much if you don't allow people to talk to each other. So it's, <laughs> it's a trade-off. Yeah. Now one of the, the one of the issues that I come across all the time um, with startups is the uh, is NDAs. And um, I can't tell you the number of times that I, I, I get a piece of paper that has got some scribble on it that says, this is our company. I said, well, OK, could I see some more? You have to sign an NDA. And you look at the NDA, and it's 30 pages of legalese that is impossible to sign. And they, well, if you can't sign it, then you know, our, our IP is so valuable, we can't allow you to see it. Um, what's your view on NDAs, Keith? Are they worth the paper they're written on? Mixed, to be honest. I think I'm more interested in the person who's going to sign it than what the paper they're written on. Uh, it, it, you know, I think it comes down to trust in, in that, that person or that, that company. Um, sometimes they're unavoidable, uh, I think, that you, you, you want to have some measure of protection in place. Uh, can you re solidly rely on them? Who knows, I think, is my, is my view. Uh, you. You know, you, you don't know what else this company is involved in in terms of what it might be doing secretly on its own, and you don't know the extent to which if something comes out, you know, they've, they, they got that from you, or that was something they were working on themselves, or whether you'll learn about what they're doing. Um, it's, um, you know, it can be very challenging, I think. Um, worth having without a doubt because you need some sort of legal fall fallback uh, if, if you're in a position where. Otherwise, disclosing what it is that you're talking about is going to jeopardise your IP position uh, or give away some trade secret or prevent you from, from filing a patent application. So it's the only way, uh, but I, you know, personally I'm always very wary of them, I think. Hmm. I, I think. I think NDAs can be extremely useful in terms of setting expectations. So it's kind of if you're discussing something with someone, by the fact that you want to have this NDA in place, then it kind of sets the level of the conversation and the expectation that I'm going to be sharing stuff with you that I don't want you to share otherwise. And you can say that, but when you have an agreement in place, it just kind of really heavily emphasises that. And I think it also helps internally with your employees to understand that they might need an NDA for certain certain things and so it, it helps them to understand that that kind of confidentiality piece. Where I think NDAs become problematic is when people spend days, weeks arguing over minutiae of, you know, yeah. specific parts to it. And I think that's that's kind of not really where they where they're useful. It's more the, the umbrella terms, what are you what are you protecting and, and you know those high level terms. I think that that can be really valuable. I think my experience I'd, again it mirrors exactly what you guys are saying. There's, 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 there's going to be certain circumstances where if you're doing a certain type of discussion or transaction or potential investor transaction, if you don't um, require certain amounts of NDA, you don't look as if you've got an environment of protecting the asset which they're going to buy, so quite fundamentally, that's really important. But I've also seen situations, and we get into these at work, where we're signing NDA agreements which there is n oh, uh, no, delaying signing NDA agreements and getting an enormous amount of conversations where the two parties are clearly no risk to each other and the NDA is purely a bureaucratic 
tick box practice so and those are painful so at times it's really important but it does say something about your business in terms of the way you protect your assets so I think you're absolutely spot on with that and so you probably have to do it it's a sort of necessary evil I think <laughs> yeah. mm. okay Pam, well thank you very much to the panel we've got five minutes left the, uh, the shepherd has told me um, are there any questions for the panel yes sir Yes, so did the panel hear that question? Yeah, yeah no, I don't think it's any, le again, it, it comes back to what, what do they protect? I mean, that's the important thing, I think. Uh, and there's no less, less value in them. Uh, and as the chairman said earlier in his introduction, there may be some advantage in keeping your patent applications as patent applications rather than getting them granted because uh, you may maintain a, a degree of uncertainty with the competition. So they don't really know what it is that your patent's going to cover, for instance. Uh, so again, it can depend on the depend on the situation you're in, and if you've got a patent application which is of dubious validity in the first place, say, and it may be, they may have some difficulty getting granted. Obviously, it's not it's not your situation, <laughs> <laughs> but then, then there may be some advantage in in just keeping it pending rather than getting to the end of the process and it being proven to be, uh, you know, not a patentable invention. So, I think there's just as much just as much value depending on what it is you want to achieve. Other people, so oh, hello, thank you. <laughs> if it's just at the other application stage, other people can't find out what it is, but surely you can just Google for them and see what they are. Mm -hmm. uh, don't quite get that. Sorry. Sorry, I don't mean they can't find out what it is. What I mean is they don't necessarily know ultimately what pattern you're going to be granted or what it will cover because during the application process, mm -hmm. your patent application will be examined by a patent office and you'll argue with them about what the final pattern should look like. Yeah. If it's still in that application stage, then they don't actually know. They're second oh, guessing what the what sort oh, of scope so of protection yeah, you might get. Yeah. Okay, I understand yeah, yeah. that. Thank you. Yeah, I think it depends on what what you what have you got those patent applications for. So um, if it's if it's for you know investor marketing, then it probably doesn't doesn't really matter. It may be nice to have have one or two granted just so you can show that you've achieved that that stage. But if it's if you actually want to be able to enforce them sooner rather than later, then obviously you need to, to get them through that process quicker. If, if you're not looking for enforcement anytime soon, then delaying gives you, as you said, the, the flexibility and, and a, you know, in terms of what you're doing. And especially in terms of markets like the US where perhaps you can keep those, those applications alive through continuations and so on, it gives you more flexibility for the future if, if the business pivots in some way or the technology pivots. So that can be very valuable. Uh, I think I think from my perspective, if you were looking for inward investment, um, I would perceive a, a, an approved patent as more valuable than an application. Um, however, that depends on how you communicate to your investor the, the likelihood of the patent being approved and how it looks. Comes out that story. So it's that story, and that, and then, and unfortunately, the story is a really big thing <laughs> when you're raising finance you know, and investment because. The guy is buying, and when they buy into you, they're buying into you, as yourself, as your skills and your ability to manage it. They're buying into the market you're going to, the technology, and a whole range of things. So um, I couldn't agree more. It's, if it's valuable to the story and it, that takes the probability of you getting funding more, then you, you need it. But I think we're almost out of time, so I would like to thank the panel very much for their participation. Thank you. Um, and if anyone has any questions or would like to talk to the panellists afterwards, please feel free. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.